Good morning, church. Today's reading is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. From the words of our Lord. Good morning. You guys doing well? Outstanding. Good to have you with us. Welcome to Desert Breeze Community Church, my favorite place to be on weekends right here. Good to have you with us. You guys love being here? You guys ready to study God's Word? Outstanding. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm chapter 1. Thank you, Julia, for reading that for us. Psalm chapter 1, Delight in God's Word, is the title of this weekend's message, Soul Satisfying Psalms. Take a look at your sermon notes here. Spiritually bored people are easily deceived by the pleasures of sin and disillusioned by the pain of suffering. I'm just kind of setting up this whole series, although Bradley did a great job at setting us up for working our way through Psalms last weekend. And, but this is a little bit of what uh, was stirring in my heart as I thought about this series. Spiritually bored people are easily deceived by the pleasures of sin and disillusioned by the pain of suffering. The call to holiness, the call to sanctification, the call to becoming more like Christ is an incredible invitation by God to us to experience all that He has for us in Christ Jesus. The call to holiness is the call to be so satisfied in God that sin loses its appeal and suffering loses its effect. Nothing will satisfy your soul like intimacy with God. I'm convinced that intimacy with God is life's most satisfying reality. And if you're not convinced of that, I I pray that you would become convinced of that. If you begin to get to know Him and experience Him more and more, maybe even today through this teaching series, man, I pray your heart would just be captivated by who He is and what He's done for you. Nothing will satisfy your soul like intimacy with God. These selected psalms will help to nurture an intimacy with God that will satisfy your soul like nothing else. Now, Psalm... The book of Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible. Psalms is the prayer book of the Bible, but Psalm 1 is not a prayer but a meditation on meditation. It is the doorway into soul-satisfying intimacy with God. It it, kind of helps to kind of set the theme, the idea to lead us so that we can understand how we are to take the Psalms and these, these prayers and pray them and interact with God. It is the doorway into soul-satisfying intimacy with God. It is the activity between Bible study and prayer. Sometimes prayer can feel like shooting a flare in the sky or a note in in a bottle thrown into the sea. Like, is anybody out there? Is anybody up there? Uh... And so we we go from Bible study right into prayer, don't have much of an experience, just kind of check the box, go through the motions. Meditation tends to change all of that. And so meditation turns it into an intimate two-way conversation with God. Your Bible study and prayer life goes from, from monologue to dialogue when you begin to meditate on the Scripture. And I don't believe this is an overstatement. I, this is very true for both my wife and I. This is perhaps the single most significant spiritual discipline in our spiritual life, in my spiritual life, that has increased my intimacy with God like nothing else and has helped me to become more like Him. It, it's really transformed my life in, in phenomenal ways, is, is, is doing this. My wife and I do this regularly, daily, I mean, throughout the day, and um, it's, just, it's, part of our, it's part of our lifestyle, and it has transformed us. And and so you can see on your notes there, delighting in God's Word will lead to meditation. If you truly delight in His Word, you're going to meditate on His Word. 
We're going we're to learn what that means here today. And meditating will lead to greater delighting in God's Word. I mean, it just, that's just how it goes. So if you truly delight in His Word, you're going to meditate on it. You're going to memorize it. You're going to reflect on it deeply. You're going to experience more and more of God. And then that will stir up in you greater delight in His Word and in God. Before we head into this study, you can see on your notes that the writer here, uh, I love how the Bible is not politically correct, okay? And so it's just straight up and just basically he's going to give us the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, okay? You're in one of those two categories. That's how the Bible uh, does, does life and the Bible is very truthful to us and I'm okay with that and we're not afraid of teaching that here at Desert Breeze. And you can see in verses 1 through 3, he gives us the way of the righteous, And then in verses 4 through 6, we have the way of the wicked. The way of the righteous is the person God blesses, and the way of the wicked is the person God judges. Very clear, lays it right out there, and I love that, and that's where we're headed with our study. We'll look at the implications or the applications of each one of those in just a moment, but let's, let's first pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we are delighted to be here this morning. We love your presence We love growing in our relationship with you. There is never, ever anything boring about you. There is always more of you to know, more of you to love, more of you to enjoy, more of you to experience. And this soul satisfaction in you is what transforms our hearts, heals our wounded souls, keeps us from being overtaken by sin and overwhelmed by suffering. Teach us how delighting and meditating on your word gives us the resilience of a tree planted by streams of water that will never, ever dry up. We pray these things in your son's beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. So the way of the righteous and then the way of the wicked. By the way, when we talk about wicked, there's actually two categories of wicked, both religious and irreligious. So religious would be moral conformity. They think that they can earn their right standing with God. The Bible would classify that as being wicked. But there's also the irreligious. That's self-discovery. I can just kind of make it up as I go. I can live according to my own feelings and thoughts and and whatever I want to do. I can do it. And so the Bible would put those in that category and not to be confused with the righteous. And let's look at the righteous here. The righteous the person God blesses. So we have to, first of all, lay a foundation. We've got to talk about this idea of righteousness. And I'm telling you, it is breathtaking. It's out of this world when you understand the righteousness, the gift righteousness, the grace righteousness that God gives to to all of us. Because who is he talking about here? He's not talking about, you know, the good are in, the bad are out. If you're righteous, you're good. If you're not, you're bad, you're out. He's actually talking more about uh, humble people who recognize that they need a righteousness given to them through Jesus Christ. In fact, the word is used, and we know that he's talking about the righteous here, because in verses 5 and 6, he calls them righteous, the righteous. The Hebrew word is uh, as justified and vindicated by God. So what does that mean? Well, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17 says, Paul says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Then it goes on to define uh, those who believe that they have this righteousness in it, in the gospel. There is a righteousness of God is revealed beginning and ending in faith, for it is written the righteous will live by faith. So righteousness is, is, is not something that you achieve It's something you receive by grace through faith in Christ. Um, Lest you think the Old Testament people got saved different from how we got saved, actually Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 4. I put that verse on your notes. The father of our faith is who? Abraham? Was that, did, did that throw you guys off there just for a moment? Okay. Who's the father of our faith? Who's known as the father of our faith? Abraham. Okay. Do I need to go through and explain all of that to you? (laughs) You guys knew that. You're just afraid, weren't you? Okay, a little intimidated. Maybe I'm going a little bit too fast here. Maybe this guy's going to come out and and hit me this morning or something. I'm not going to do that. I love you guys. I love this church. Uh, No, the father of our faith is Abraham. That's why he brings up Abraham. And he actually says, how was Abraham saved? It says right there, in Romans 4.3, and he's actually quoting Genesis 15.6, 
So God shows up to Abraham, promises him land and lineage. In that lineage would come the Messiah. And it says, then Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Boom! Yes! Old Testament, and that's true in the New Testament, we put our faith in Christ and we are in that moment, made right before God. Now, righteousness is more than just forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, future. It's an invitation to be His dearly beloved child in whom He is greatly pleased. And you didn't earn it, you can't unearn it. You're either in or you're out by grace through faith in Christ. It is amazing. It is out of this world. It's called grace righteousness as opposed to religion is a works righteousness. In religion, you work to be right with God. In the gospel, you receive it, you don't achieve it. This is out of this world. It's amazing. I've never gotten over it. It's just like when I begin to understand that, I go, whoa. And, and so what's, what's so amazing about this is that then from that point on, you work from your righteousness, for your, from your righteousness rather than for your righteousness. So when we talk about a righteous person, you're working from your righteousness. So when I describe what what a righteous person does, this is what a righteous person does. When they understand that they're right with God through Jesus Christ, this is what that looks like. And, And so righteousness is not freedom to sin, but freedom from sin. Does that make sense? So it's not saying, oh, you're right with God, so you can do whatever you want to do. You can live however you want to live. Well, that would be crazy. No, he sets you free to be able to live for him and for his glory so that you can experience a freedom unlike you can experience any place else. And so what he, when he looks at us through Christ, we are holy and blameless before God, Ephesians 1, 4. So this, this righteousness is a right standing with God is something you, uh, it's not something you achieve, but something you receive by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, I won't say any more. That, that's enough. I, I wanted to camp out on that whole thing right there because that, that in itself is amazing, but we got to keep rolling here because we've got a lot of territory to cover. And so the righteous, the person God blesses is, and you can see three things, three characteristics, separated from the world, saturated with God's Word, and then situated by the waters. So you're not working for your righteousness, you're working from your righteousness, your right standing with God. Everything that you need is found in God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's the first one, separated from the world. And I'm not saying, when I say separated here, I'm not saying that you load yourself up with a lot of ammo and guns and food and go up in the mountains and hide out until Jesus comes back. Not a bad idea, actually. Anyway, uh, I'm kidding. That, that's not what we're supposed to do, okay? Um, and so we're, we're actually supposed to be in the world, but not what? But not of the world. John chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. So being separated from the world is that we're just different from the world. This is what he's talking about here. And he goes on in verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of the sinners or sits in the seat of the scoffers or the scornful. So let's, let's meditate on this this morning. Let's kind of walk through this step by step. So first of all, he says, blessed is the man. This is a profound statement. We, we say, God bless you, and kind of throw it around loosely, not really understanding the full weight of that word. Blessed means total fulfillment, complete well-being. Most of you are familiar with the ironic blessing that we give you typically on weekends when we take, partake in communion. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Sixth chapter of Numbers, 24 through 26. So the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's that word, blessed. Total fulfillment, complete well-being found in an intimate relationship with God through his grace, favor, and peace upon us. It's, it's out of this world. This is what everyone on planet earth longs for more than anything, whether they realize it or not. You'll notice that the psalmist doesn't say blessed is a smart person or a rich person or a gifted person or an attractive person. No, just a person. In fact, we know he's talking about a righteous person, as I've already stated, based on verses 5 and 6. Nor does he say blessed is a man who seeks blessedness or, or happiness. 
but blessed is the man who seeks righteousness is the impl- implication here. See, if you seek righteousness more than happiness, you'll get both. If you seek happiness more than righteousness, you'll get neither. And what that does, it puts you in one of two categories. You're either righteous or you're wicked. You're you're living your life through the spirit, God-centeredness, or self-centeredness. Christians are the happiest people in the world when they live in the reality of what they have through Christ's sacrificial love, all that he's accomplished for us on the cross. When you live in the reality of that, oh my goodness, you will be the happiest person on the planet. The problem is, is gospel amnesia. We forget it. We, we, we lose track of it. We, we build our sense of identity and security and our well-being based on our circumstances or the people in our life or the things that we have or don't have, rather than the unshakable foundation of our identity in Christ Jesus and who He is and what He's done for us. And that'll make you happy, that righteousness that you have in Him. You can't, you can't earn it. You can't unearn it. You either are or you aren't. You either have it or you don't. If you put your faith in Christ, you have it. Begin to live in the reality of it. And we're going to talk about that. This is what He's talking about here. I mean, it's out of this world what He's talking about here. And so, um, so, what he says here, so he talks about blessed is the man who does not, did you notice here he's actually helping us to walk through a particular verse that's found in the New Testament, and actually our youth use this verse as their theme verse, our anomaly, our youth group, anybody know what the theme verse is? Okay, don't everyone answer at once. Uh, actually, where's, where's the youth pastor over here? Uh, you don't even know the verse, do you? That's really frustrating. He's looking back behind him right now. You know, wake him up over there, uh, Brittany. Romans 12, 2. Woo! Oh, there you go. He, I, he's pulling my chain here this morning. He's messed up. Where's security? Okay. Okay, uh, those that are watching online, it's not getting out of hand. We got it under control, okay? So here we go. Uh, it's Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind. This is what he's talking about here. Now think about this. This is He's actually showing us what that looks like. Do not, uh, blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly or stand in the way of the sinner or sits in the seat of the scornful. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But his delight is in God's word and he meditates on it day and night. Do you see it there? It's pretty powerful. I love it. So I'm either being conformed to the values of this world or being transformed by the values of God's Word. And he's actually showing us, this is brilliant, he's showing us the process of being conformed to the world. I see people get taken out by the world all the time. In my over 30 years of ministry, I see this slow, silent toll of spiritual decay take place in people's lives. It's almost imperceptibly happening in their life. And and he's showing us the process here. It starts with walking in the counsel of the ungodly. It has to do with your beliefs. It always starts with what you believe that is true about God, about you, why you're here, why you exist. And then that moves from walking in the counsel of the ungodly to standing in the way of sinners. Hanging out with sinners is literally what he's saying. And standing in the way of sinners, it it goes from your beliefs to your behavior. You begin to behave consistent with your beliefs. You will always behave in a manner that's consistent with your beliefs. So it goes from walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the way of sinners, and then here's the last place where you land. You sit in the seat of the scornful, scoffers. You belong. So you believe these things that are consistent with the values of this world, and then over time you begin to behave in a manner consistent with the world, and then before long you just, you belong. You're part of them. You're scoffing just like the rest of them. Now, I found this interesting. I want to focus on scoffer. The word scoffer here is, the Hebrew means to deride, mock, speak cruelly and violently. Sounds like our culture, doesn't it? Watch late night time talk show host. 
A lot of scoffing, a lot of podcasts out there, a lot of scoffing. A lot of the newscasts currently are scoffing about those that are on the other side of the aisle. It goes both ways. I, I see a lot of that. And this is coming out of a heart of hatefulness and bitterness, certainly not out of righteousness, love, joy, and peace, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. This scoffing is coming out of pride, self-righteousness, judgmentalism. It's laughing at you using dogmatic assertions rather than defensible arguments. Most people don't know the difference between the two. In fact, most people don't know the stats here that 80% of Christian kids go to college and defect from the faith, not because of defensible arguments, but dogmatic assertions with an attitude of scoffing. Genesis chapter 3, this is exactly what the serpent did. This is Satan. Scoffing is demonic. It's bitterness. It's anger. It's frustration. Rather than just to present a defensible argument, which you don't have an argument really against God, you just make fun of people. You scoff at them. Oh, those people are idiots. Oh, they're so stupid. They don't even know what's going on. That's our culture. That's what Satan did in Genesis 3. Did God actually say that? He didn't say that. Getting her and him, he was right there, to question God's commandments, doubting God's commandments. And then verse 4, Genesis 3, you will not surely die. You can't trust God's character. See, if Satan can't get you to doubt God's existence, he'll get you to doubt God's goodness. That he, God, is holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest at heart. You can't trust his commandments and character. There's two reasons people defect from the faith. They defect from the faith because they are deceived by the pleasures of sin, which they doubt God's commandments. Listen, God gave us his commandments not to burden us, but to bless us. They come to us out of his perfect love and infinite wisdom. Now, you don't obey his commandments to get his righteousness. You have his righteousness, therefore you obey his commandments. You want to honor him and bring glory to his name. By the way, Jesus summarized all of his commandments in two, remember? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, there it is. He does that because he loves you like no one else, and he has your very best interest at heart. To doubt that is to be deceived by our adversary, and also to doubt his, his character. So, so people defect for two reasons, deceived by the pleasures of sin, that has to do with his commandments, or disillusioned by the pain of suffering, that's doubting his character. Like, why am I going through this? If God, if you're looking after me, I, it doesn't look like you are, I'm really struggling here. And so you begin to doubt his character, and he proved his character once and for all on the cross. God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us once and for all. He showed us his character and all that he is and all that he has for us. Now, here's your greatest defense. Here's your next one, saturated with God's word. So if you're going to keep from being conformed to this world and if you want to be transformed by God's word, it starts right here, saturated with God's word. Look at verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The word delight is a great word. It means to desire or take pleasure in something. It means to feel rich. You delight in God's word, you feel rich when you begin to understand what he's saying to you, what he's speaking to you. A great verse for this would be uh, Psalm 119.103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than coconut cream pie to my lips. Oh, that's not actually what it says, okay, but I inserted my own, actually honey, I don't think that was their sweetener in those days. My sweetener is coconut cream pie, okay? <laughs> apple, apple pie a la mode, uh, any, any number of things like that. So he's just saying, you think of your best, uh, your favorite dessert, and just saying, he's just saying, hey, that doesn't even come close to tasting your word, interacting with you, God, knowing you. And he uses the word law of the Lord. What is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about the whole of Scripture. 
John 10, 34, Jesus said to the Pharisees, religious leaders, is it not written in your law? And then he goes on to quote the Psalms. So he's actually saying it's all referred to as law, kind of almost uh, figuratively speaking, but in a sense, he's talking about the whole of Scripture is authoritative standard for faith and practice is what he's saying. All of Scripture is our standard, standard for faith and practice. It is what we are to believe and how to behave as God's people. So treating God's Word as authoritative means letting it both convict you, tell you things you don't want to hear, and also comfort you, tell you things you want to hear. Every good relationship, every healthy relationship will have those two elements. If you're coming to God and you discount the hard things only to receive the good things, you're not gonna really ultimately receive the good things after a while. They're not gonna be that good. You, you don't have, you have a God who's a figment of your imagination. That's not the true and living God, that's a made up God. Believe me, my, my wife tells me things I don't want to hear. Anybody out there, any man out there that would say that your wife tells you things that you don't want to hear from time to time? If they don't, what, what do you have, a, 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 robot, a, robot, yeah, a robot kind of wife? My wife's not a robot, okay? And uh, it's called Stepford Wives, by the way. It's that movie, okay? You guys, you guys familiar with that? That's not a bad idea either. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm kidding. It's, that's a horrible idea. It's not a relationship. But, uh, boy, this sermon is really going way off the rails here this morning. <laughs> My wife tells me, she's she going she to tell me about what I just said just right there, okay? You're going to tell me things I don't want to hear. <laughs> she's over in the children's, so don't tell her. Nobody tell her, okay? She's, she's helping out with the children's, but somebody will tell her, and she'll be telling me, why'd you say that? Okay. Okay, where am I on this? Okay. Treating God's Word as authoritative means it's, it's letting it both convict you, tell you things you don't want to hear, and comfort you, tell you things you want to hear. Unless all of Scripture is a word of law to you, it will never be a word of love to you. So a blessed, righteous person loves having God tell them how to live their life, is really what he's saying. They delight in God's Word and meditate on it day and night. They just enjoy God. God, you tell me how to live my life. I want to honor you because this righteousness that you've given me, this is out of this world. I, I just want to celebrate that until you take me home to be with you for all eternity. And so our relationship with God, I think what it's telling us here too is that our relationship with God should be both intellectually sound, law of the Lord, and experientially satisfying delight and take pleasure in it. So if it's intellectually sound minus experientially satisfying, that's called dead orthodoxy. That's religion, you're just going through the motions. And those are miserable people to be around, religious people. It's all information. I've crammed so much information into my brain, I'm terribly unloving too. And that's how there are people out there like that. There are religious groups that are out there like that. They call themselves Christians. There's no experience of His love. They talk a lot about it. They'll beat you up over it because they're right and everybody else is wrong, but they, they, they don't experience the love of God. Uh, the other part of this is uh, if you're experientially satisfying, your belief system is experientially satisfying minus intellectually soundness, your God is a figment of your imagination. It's not the true and living God of the Bible. So there's that balance. Our relationship with God should be both intellectually sound, law of the Lord, and experientially satisfying, delight and take pleasure in it. And then he uses the word meditates. Okay, wow, it took us all this time to get to the most important part of this is to learn how to meditate. woo -hoo! here we are. Okay, stop talking, Pastor Ray, and start teaching. Okay, it is reflecting, pondering, assessing, considering. That's what meditation is the implications of truth from God's Word until it stirs your affections and moves you to action. So think about this. Let's meditate on the word meditation. It is moving a biblical truth from concept to reality, from your head to your heart to your hands, your actions. So it has your attention it stirs your affections, 
and it moves you to action. But if it's all in your head, it never gets down into your affections, it's not going to move your actions, it's not going to change you and how you're living your life. So meditation helps you to do that. Three kinds of people in the world, there are first people who don't believe there is a personal God of love. Second, there are people who do believe there is a personal God of love but aren't experiencing his love. And then third, there are people who do believe there is a personal God of love and are experiencing that love. The key to that last person is meditation. They're meditating on God's word and it's moving from their head down into their heart working its way out into their hands and how they relate to other people. It's not just a concept, it's a reality that they are living. Meditation is the affecting of the heart through an intense use of the mind. Meditation is the mind descending into the heart until it catches fire in your whole life. Where it comes alive, just like, whoa! That is overwhelming. I mean. Just me preparing for this message, thinking about righteousness, being reminded of our righteousness was just like, oh, I'm in. I want that. I need that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your sacrificial love on the cross, giving me that righteousness. Uh, I'm going to give you, here's a negative uh, example of that. It's found in Psalm 39.3, and it's negative because He's talking about anger, trying to control his anger and his, uh, his speech, his tongue. You know, if you can't control your, your anger, you're not going to be able to control your tongue. You're going to say things you probably shouldn't have said. And that's what he's talking about here. And listen to what he says, Psalm 39.3, my heart became hot within me as I mused. The word is meditated, as I meditated, as I thought about that, as I thought about what those people said to me. <sighs> The fire burned, then I spoke with my tongue. I'll let them have it. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's a negative, uh, negative response. I'll never forget this in the Davis home. I mean, no one loves Jesus like my mom, and uh, she loves Jesus a lot. Most of you know that, and, uh, but I, I'll never forget this. I haven't heard her say it as much as she got older, but growing up in the Davis home, we would come back from the marketplace, and my mom would be thinking about something that happened in the marketplace, like maybe someone ripped her off or somebody charged her more than what they should have charged her or whatever, and I would hear her say, the more I think about that, the madder I get. And I would think as a kid, well, stop thinking about it, Mom. Why are you meditating on that, okay? Why are you reflecting on that till your heart is burning and you're ready to go over there and tell them off? And that's, that's what he's talking about there. Now reverse that. Think about, when you think about it and you reflect on Christ and who he is and what he's done for you and who you are in light of him, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life because that's where your identity is. Your identity never changes, even if it's 120 outside, okay? It doesn't matter who you are in him and who he is to you and what you have in him. It doesn't change, regardless of the people, things, and circumstances of your life. You think about that, and that gets a hold of your heart. It begins to change every part of you. You begin to shine in the dark places all around you. You put him on display. You manifest Christ. That's what he's called us to do. That's what he wants us, and it's out of that relationship, intimacy with him as you're meditating. So it is thinking through the biblical implications intellectually, emotionally, and volitionally. Am I living in light of this? What difference does this make? Am I taking this seriously? If I believed and held to this, how would that change my life? When I forget this, how does that affect me and all my relationships? So there's a difference between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation. You guys know the difference? Eastern meditation is actually emptying your mind. Don't do that. Biblical meditation is filling your mind with God's Word. And notice he says night and day. In other words, saturate your life with God's Word. Now, slow reflection and meditation is a lost art in our hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder culture. Would you agree with that? Oh, my goodness. And uh, that's our culture we live in. This hinders true intimate conversation with God preceded by listening to his voice through meditation on Scripture. We can't even hear his voice because we don't take out enough time to even think and reflect deeply enough on his word. 
We've got so many distractions. So what we have to do is ruthlessly and not only eliminate hurry from our life, but eliminate distractions from our life. I like this quote from C.S. Lewis. This was before uh, actually cell phones and the Internet, okay? Just keep that in mind. As he talks about the radio. Anybody know what a radio is? Okay. Okay. So um, how to avoid God is this quote. Avoid silence. Avoid solitude. Avoid any train of thought that leads us off the beaten track. Concentrate on money, sex, status, health, and above all, your own grievances. Keep the radio on. You could say just keep surfing the internet or keep that phone close by, always looking, scrolling. Live in a crowd. Use plenty of sedation. How to avoid God. Now let me ask you this. What what would you think if Nancy and I didn't talk for days or maybe even weeks? Especially after this sermon. (laughs) You'd think maybe she's kind of upset at me, wouldn't you? Or I'm upset at her. That would be odd. We hop in the car, we're going to take a trip up to Prescott, and we don't even say a word to each other. We just kind of go all the way up there. That would be weird, wouldn't it? If the only time you think about God or talk to God is once a week at church or once a day in your devotions, then you are not separated from the world and saturated by God's Word, and therefore you won't be situated by streams of water, and drought will take you out. You're not communing with Him. You're not interacting with Him. I mean, as believers in Christ, that's the best thing we have is relationship with Him, intimacy with Him, interaction with Him 24-7. I wake up in the middle of the night. I get up in the morning. I'm taking a shower. I'm interacting with Him. I'm meditating. I'm reflecting on His Word. Oh, my goodness. That's what takes me through my day. It fills my heart with His love and His grace and His mercy. I mean, just think about this. If you woke up every day and maybe throughout the day and you just enjoyed being his beloved child in whom he is well pleased, that's a reality. That's a fact. And you begin to absorb that throughout the day, how great is the love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are I love you, God, because you first loved me and gave your life for me. Your perfect love chases away all my fears. Your steadfast love is better than anything in this world. Nothing can separate me from your love. And God, your love is so great, so vast, so wonderful that I can even love and forgive my enemies. Now, I just quoted about four or five different verses right there, just meditating, thinking, praying that back to God. Imagine if you lived your life like that. You just took one Bible verse and just thought about it throughout the day and just rolled it over in your heart and your mind. I'm telling you what, God will light it up in your heart, and you will not be the same. It will transform you. See, this is the, why Psalm 1 is the pathway into the prayers in Psalm for us to connect deeply with God to know Him. Who you are can be no better or no worse than the thoughts you entertain in your head. The question isn't, are you meditating, but what are you meditating on? We're all meditating. We're always meditating. We're always thinking. We're always talking to ourselves. We're always reflecting. The most important thing about your mind is what it is fixed on. And I know this. I know this. Old habits die hard. We've got these neural pathways that are second nature instincts within us, and so we've got to chase those thoughts down and bring them into the obedience of Jesus Christ. We've got to work hard to establish brand new neural pathways, and so meditation helps us to do that. I'm telling you, I've been doing this for decades, and it has made a major difference in my life. My wife has done the same, and it's, it's how I actually prepare messages. That's why it's, my messages are so packed full. I could go three hours, okay, without even taking a breath, okay. And there are people that come into our church from time to time and will criticize us over the length of our, our messages. And I don't do sermonettes here. You guys know that. You're not here for a little sermonette because sermonettes produce Christianettes, okay? So there you go. So yeah, all four of us would say yeah to that. 
Praise God. The rest of you, wake up. Okay. Wake up. Okay. Second part. Actually, fourth part. Okay. I'm, I'm pulling your chain here. But here's the thing. Take a look at this verse. This is a powerful... This, here's a counseling verse. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. Up on the screen. Let's walk through this. The eye... So your perspective... What kind of a... So don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, your heart. What's your, what's your eye, your perspective, your mindset? You have a biblical worldview. You believe God is for you and not against you. So the eye, your perspective, is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. Yeah. Woo, I want that. Righteousness, peace, and joy, love, joy, peace, everything we need in Christ Jesus, my perspective. He's for me. He will never leave me or forsake me. No one loves me like he loves me. So I want to live in the reality of that. That's my perspective. When I face the difficulties of life, he's always there. He's, he's leading me. He's guiding me. He's empowering me. That's what that, that's, this is a great counseling verse. Welcome to group counseling. So the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if your eye, bad perspective, oh, this is terrible. Oh, I can't believe this is happening to me. Oh, my goodness, where are you, God? I start questioning his goodness. Oh, I, there's no way that God could be working in this. Oh, there's no what he, it, he is. He's working in all of this. Read your Bible. Meditate on his word. Live it out. Live in the reality of it. This is what he's talking about here. Okay. So, okay, where am I on this? Okay. I, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Listen to me. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you that makes you or breaks you in life. It's not your circumstances that make you and break you. It's your character, and your character has to do with your perspective and whether or not that you have a biblical worldview. <clears throat> if God is for you, who can be against you? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Bring it on. Yeah. Gates of hell won't prevail. I mean, there's, there's just verses that just come to my mind when I face difficulties and things that are going on. Those are the neural pathways that I've developed through the years. Not perfect. There's still junk in there once in a while. There's stuff that pops up and goes, where did that come from? That's wicked. That's evil. That's wrong. I overcome that with the Word of God, just as Jesus did as he was being tempted by Satan. And so if you're angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, discouraged, ticked off, then, man, you got to take a, take a look at your life. You're, you're experiencing death. You're probably walking in the flesh. Remember Romans 8, 5, and 6? The mindset of the flesh is death. The mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. That's what God offers us. Okay, and this, this will put you situated by the waters. Got to keep rolling here. Oh, we got plenty of time. Yes. Verse 3, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The tree planted by streams of water. Uh, John 7, 37 through 39, Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. When you think of rivers of living water, it's just, you're thinking of satisfaction and contentment and refreshment and restoration and, and all of that. This is what he's talking about here. Everyone has the roots of their soul. They're delighting and meditating on something as their source of meaning, hope, and happiness in life. If I don't meditate on God's word until my heart is hot with assurance, then I will seek love and acceptance from worldly achievement, status, and relationships. So how do I know the difference between the two? How do I know where I'm seeking, where my root system really is? I can say it's in Christ, but it might be elsewhere. How do I know? Well, if intimacy with God isn't your most satisfying reality. In other words, if you're not situated by waters, finding your deepest satisfaction in Him, 
then good times will lead to overconfidence and spiritual indifference where you might start neglecting your spiritual disciplines. You won't meditate. Eh, I don't need God. Or you put the Bible on the shelf. You put God on the shelf. You don't come to churches regularly. There's a lot of things that happen. And so in good times, you become proud. You have spiritual indifference. In bad times, will lead to discouragement and despair. I'm telling you, that is a dead giveaway that you are using God and not coming to be with him, and you don't find him as your deepest satisfaction. That's a fact. I'm telling you, if he's your deepest satisfaction, good times, bad times, it doesn't matter. You just want him. And you're going to shine bright in the good times for him and shine bright in the bad times for him. You're not going to become spiritually indifferent during good times and then in despair during hard times because you haven't been cultivating a relationship with him. Countless people grab their Bible in crisis and quote prayers in crisis and haven't been with God, and that's why they are devastated because their root system is in anything other than Christ Jesus. So I'm telling you, hard times are coming to us. Hard times are coming to you. I'm not a prophet of doom. That's just how life goes. The way we're headed as a country doesn't look really that good. I keep praying like crazy for a change in the political climate and in every place else. But we need to be that light in this dark place. You're not going to be that light. You're going to be taken out if you're not doing what he's saying here. Separated from the world, sat, uh, saturated with God's word, and situated by rivers of water. You do that, you could face anything. And you will shine bright for Jesus. And you're going to see people come to faith through your life. That's what he's called us to do. Okay. Yields fruit in season. My wife and I talked about this. You can plant, you know, different trees and stuff at different times of the year. But in, in general, there are four seasons that farmers work around. There's the winter, which would be dormancy, pruning. God seems distant. There's going to be times in your life where he's going to seem diff- distant. You got to be okay with that. And then the springtime would be more planting. So winter is pruning. Springtime is planting. You keep planting the seeds in your heart. You keep studying God's word. You keep coming to church. You keep doing those things. Well, I'm not feeling God. Well, you're certainly not going to feel God if you stop doing those things. But hang in there long enough because there's a season coming up where you're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. So you can't stop planting the seeds, and in the summer, you've got to do some protecting, watering, fertilizing, weeding, insecticides. This is make or break for farmers. But then fall, autumn, producing a harvest. But you don't give up. You keep going. You keep coming after him. You keep looking to him. You keep trusting in him. And your leaf will not wither, as it says, an evergreen tree that is free from the crippling damage of drought, negative circumstance. That's why I put John 10.10 10 there, because the Bible is so realistic. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, we live in a broken world filled with sin and suffering, but I came that you might have life and have it to the fullest in the midst of that. Now, here's what you need to keep in mind. Being like a tree planted by streams of water, meditation doesn't eliminate problems. This is what he's saying here. But gives you resources to not just survive, but thrive in the midst of problems. Joy is not the absence of problems, but the presence of Christ cultivating intimacy with him. The ultimate defeat of evil. Listen to me. The enemy is after you, and he wants to take you down by getting you to question God's goodness in your life and to deceive you by the pleasures of sin or disillusion you in the pain of suffering. The ultimate defeat of evil is that it makes you a better, stronger, wiser, deeper person. When you go through hard times, it drives the root system down deeper into his love and grace and mercy. That defeats evil. That's the defeat of evil. The ultimate defeat of evil is that it makes you a better person. The ultimate triumph of evil is that it makes you a bitter person, a toxic person, a scoffer. I got it. Life is hard. But man, if you don't protect your heart and you don't keep running to the grace of God, it tells us in 1215 of Hebrews, don't miss the grace of God and let a bitter root grow up and cause trouble and defile many. That's the end result of becoming like the world, scoffer, angry, 
ticked off about everything and anybody. You don't need to go there. You don't need to be that. That's what he's saying. It's absolutely amazing. I love it. And so, all he does prospers. In other words, you can grow in intimacy and maturity in Christ. I love this verse, Isaiah 54, 10. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. Sounds like a lot of bad stuff happening there, but in the midst of that, a lot of good stuff's happening. So in the midst of your bad stuff, really good stuff can happen if you look to him. And that's what he's saying. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. See, meditation gives you access to streams of water, intimacy with God that is more satisfying than your best days and more strengthening and sustaining than anything else in your worst days. See, if you have learned how to do meditation, when people reject you or are mean to you, your roots are so deep into God's love. His love is so real to you that you can shrug it off and you can handle it. No big deal, water on a duck's back. I have righteousness in him. He loves me, he adores me, he rejoices over me. If you lose your job or a vast amount of money, if your roots the roots of your heart are down deep into God's presence and providence. You can shrug it off. You can handle it. You move on. If your spouse is extremely angry with you and says to you, we must talk, we need to talk, you can shrug it off and tell your spouse you'll be unavailable for a few months meditating. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't, don't go by that last one, okay? So if you can't shrug it off, if you can't handle it, if it casts you down, if you've never learned how to put your roots down into the deep groundwater of God's Word, that's what it's saying. It's a dead giveaway. If you're taken out by the sin and suffering of this world, it's because you don't have a root system down into God next to living waters, all of what He wants to provide for you. If a tree is by the river, it doesn't matter whether it rains or not. It always has water. Meditation enables you to access God like that. Now, I'm going to give you the fill in the blanks for the next section because I want to get to the very last part because I'm going to teach you how to do that here this morning. And we got, uh, we got just a few more minutes, but let me give you this. So, so the opposite of a righteous person is the wicked person, the person God judges. And the reason why God doesn't judge us is because Jesus took our judgment for us. You guys understand that? on the cross. So that's why we have the righteousness. But if you refuse Jesus, this is what awaits you. And, and so I'll just give you one verse that kind of describes this wicked person, Psalm 10:4. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him, does not seek God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. So it's one thing to say there is no God and live your life as if there is no God, but don't get caught in, the, in this idea or in this kind of lifestyle where you say there is a God and yet you live your life as if there is no God. I know a lot of people who say, oh, I believe there's a God, and yet they live their life as if there is no God. You're in that category of wicked. You're not interacting with Him. You don't know Him. You're not giving your life to Him. If you haven't and you're here this morning, give your life to Him. Commit your life to Him. I mean, what are you waiting for? My goodness, do you understand what he offers you? This is out of this world. And so this is what happens to those who are wicked, the person God judges. They're scattered by the winds of life, instability. Look at verse 4. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. I don't think I need to explain chaff to you if you understand the winnowing process of wheat. How many are familiar with the song Dust in the Wind by Kansas back in the 70s, huh? Oh, you really know that point then, don't you? Okay. And then separated from God and his people, insignificance. Look at verse 5. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. That's insignificance. The only one that can give us significance is God. And I won't go into that. The next one is shattered, perished for all eternity, insecurity. And, and what he says in John 3, 16, 17, 18, and 19 he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. But if you reject Christ, here's the verdict. Life has come into the world. Men prefer darkness over light. That's the judgment is what he's saying here. 
And so, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Oh my goodness, those are sweet words. He knows, he's involved intimately in your life. If you put your faith in Christ, he'll never leave you or forsake you, he's always there. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. That's how the psalm ends. Second Corinthians 5.21, he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, application. Here we go. This is uh, what I do, what I've learned. This is a, a one model that you can use, how to delight in God's Word. Turn God's written Word into conversation with the living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's how I approach God's Word. This is what's true about God's Word. Every time I pick up His Word and I study His Word, it's his next statement on the notes. God's written Word is the very presence of God, Hebrews 4.12. It is alive and powerful. You're inter, inter, encountering the living God when you study this book, when you study His Word. Based on... Hebrews 4.12, the very words of God, 2 Timothy 3.16-17, they're God-breathed. So it's not only the very presence of God, it's the very words of God. I'm encountering the living God. Heaven and earth will pass away. His word will never pass away. You can build your life upon this, and you can endure all the storms of life. I gave you those verses there about the man building his life upon the rock as opposed to the sand. And the guy that builds his life on the rock is one who hears God's word and obeys them, has a relationship with God. And that's part of that. And so that's how I approach it. And then look at this next verse, John 5, 39 through 40. This is Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. And it's so easy to fall prey to what the Pharisees are doing. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. When you think of eternal life, think of the presence of God. Because he says eternal life, uh, it tells us in John 17, 3, for this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So think of that, the presence of God. Those are kind of synonymous. And so he says, you think that they're going to give you eternal life, the presence of God. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me, that is to interact with me, that you may have eternal life. It's through interacting with Jesus. It's a, this relationship with him. And so what you want to do is turn God's written word into a conversation with God's living word, Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying. Two broad categories of praying God's word. First is promises to believe and exhortations to obey. So here's an easy way to remember it. So when you're studying, you come across a verse, you look at it and go, is that a belief verse or is that a behavior verse? Is that correcting my beliefs or correcting my behavior, helping me in one of those two categories? So the first one is promises to believe. So the first thing I do is we thank God for a particular truth, turn it into a declaration of thanksgiving or trust. Let me give you one verse found in John chapter 15 on abiding, intimacy with God, uh, dwelling uh, making your home in Christ, having a relationship with Him. John 15, 9, it's a powerful verse. This is what he says. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. <laughs> That's good. So thank you, Jesus, that you love me with the same intensity with which the Father loves you. <laughs> That's good. That's amazing. And then the second thing, ask God for more understanding or revelation of a specific truth. Jesus, give me more understanding about how you love me with the same intensity with which the Father loves you. Let it overwhelm me today. Let it so fill my heart up that I would begin to share that with everybody around me. It would be an overflow in my own life. That's, that's what I pray. That's what I do is I meditate on his word and, and the Lord begins to light that up in my heart. Here's the second one, exhortation to obey. First, we commit to obey a truth. We make simple declarations of our resolve to obey it. Jesus, I commit to abide in or focus on your love. I set my heart to study and search out this truth from your word and to live in it. So remember John 15, 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So Lord, teach me how to do that. Teach me how to abide. Give me the ability to, to pull that off. In fact, that's the next one. Second, 
We ask God to empower us to obey that particular truth. We ask him to help us by giving us wisdom, motivation, and power to obey in specific areas. That's just one verse. You could take one verse. You read a chapter, one verse pops off the page, take it with you throughout the day and begin to use this, uh, this model. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why we're doing DB Devotional. You can find that on YouTube or our website. It'll walk you through kind of, you can use this process with that. So this is the growing notes using these two broad categories. Pray Psalm 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6 this week. That's your homework, okay? So here's where we're going next weekend. Uh, next weekend's Father's Day. We're going to celebrate dads and we're going to celebrate our Father, the Father Heart of God, Psalm 103. And uh, the Father Heart of God for you is one of the most important truths in the Bible. This will bring more healing to your heart from past hurts unlike anything else, if you understand that. That's what we're going to talk about next week. And so uh, I'll be up front at the end of the service along with any available elders and leaders. If you're new, we'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you. And... Uh, if you don't know Jesus, come on up. I'd like to introduce you to him and help you to pray, pray to receive him into your life and to know him better. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer those questions for you. Let's pray. Father God, may we be people who are truly blessed, contented, happy, satisfied, and are righteous, our right standing with you by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, not seduced into believing, behaving, belonging to this world, either naively going with the crowd or becoming a hardened scoffer. Lord, but help us to delight and meditate day and night on your words so that even in times of drought and difficulty, we would have a water source in your Son, our Savior Jesus, that bears fruit in season, does not wither, and always, proffers, uh, all, always prospers for our joy and your glory. In Jesus' beautiful name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Love you guys.